on today's story beat. An actor needs to be flexible. You know, you need to be able to go with the flow. Uh, you need to be able to ride a wave. You need to be able to figure, you know, adapt to whatever is thrown at you. And what, whether that's on stage or whether that's in life. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, the brilliant actor, singer, and director Robert Cuccioli, is renowned for his critically acclaimed Tony nominated dual performance as the good Dr. Henry Jekyll and his sinister alter ego, Mr. Edward Hyde, in a little musical I know something about called Jekyll and Hyde. For the record, I conceived the show and wrote the original book and lyrics in collaboration with composer Frank Wildhorn. Prior to his sensational run in Jekyll and Hyde on Broadway, Robert dazzled audiences across America in the show's pre-Broadway First National Tour. Both the tour and Broadway featured Linda Etter and Christiane Knoll. For Broadway, Robert received Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle, and FANY Awards for Outstanding Actor in a Musical. Robert's other Broadway appearances include playing Javert in Les Miserables, and his high-flying performance in another dual role, Dr. Norman Osborn, a.k.a. the Green Goblin, in the rock musical Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Robert's first big break was playing Lancelot, opposite the legendary Richard Harris's King Arthur in the U.S. and Canadian tours of Camelot. He's also performed in Candor and Ebbs and The World Goes Round off-Broadway as Nathan in The Rothschilds, and years later as Meyer Rothschild in Rothschild and Sons, which was also staged in London's Off West End. Robert's undertaken challenging roles at numerous theaters all over the U.S., appearing in Mari Estens and Arthur Coppett's Phantom of the Opera, leading roles in numerous productions of Shakespeare plays, and in classic plays and musicals like Amadeus, 1776, Guys and Dolls, South Pacific, The Sound of Music, Funny Girl, Oklahoma, The Man of La Mancha, Jesus Christ Superstar, and many more. He's created roles in new musicals and plays, including White Guy on the Bus, A Moon to Dance By with Jane Alexander, and Bike Man, a 9-11 play, among others. TV credits include The Sinner, Elementary, White Collar, Baywatch, Sliders, recurring roles on All My Children, One Life to Live, Loving, and The Guiding Light. Also, you can see Robert in such movies as The Stranger, The Rest of Us, Impossible Monsters, Columbus on Trial, and Woody Allen's Celebrity. As a director, Robert has staged Jekyll and Hyde at Houston's Theater Under the Stars, the Westchester Broadway Theater, North Shore Music Theater, and here in Pittsburgh at the CLO. He's also directed productions of The Glass Menagerie and The Merchant of Venice at the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. Robert has sung at a host of venues around the U.S., and his exceptional voice can be heard on the original Broadway cast recording of Jekyll and Hyde, and on the cast recordings of Rothschild and Sons, And the World Goes Round, the Mari Estin Songbook, and Jacques Brel is Alive and Well and Living in Paris. And please be sure to check out Robert's debut solo album, The Look of Love. So for all those reasons, and many more, I'm beyond thrilled to have the extraordinarily multi-talented Robert Cuccioli as my guest on Story Beat today. Bob, I'm so very glad to welcome you to the show. Steve, it's so good to see you and to hear you. Uh, That was quite an introduction. (laughs) What do you need me for now? Well, we're all done. Have a nice day. See ya. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, all right, let's go back in history a little bit. You've been at the, at this acting game, the stage game for a little while, but at what age were you when the bug first hit you that you wanted to do this thing? Well, that's a complicated answer. Um, I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version. Sure. Uh, This is actually my second career. I started off in finance. I uh, doesn't everybody in show business? <clears throat> no, yeah, oh yeah, no, no. A lot of people just come out of the womb knowing that they want to do this, but yes. uh, I did not. I pursued a, 
a career as a, a corporate lawyer. And um, wow, yeah. And I went to uh, St. John's University for a finance degree. Um, but all through my younger years, all through um, my elementary school years and my high school and college years, I did uh, some variation of music, whether it be glee clubs or um, you know the you know, the drama clubs in our high school uh, and also in college. But I never thought of doing it as a career. I never but you, but you were this. singing from early on. You knew you had a voice. Uh, I sang. But I did it for fun. I didn't do it as a as a, a goal to anything else. I would sing while I cut the lawn. You know, I was I was always um, I always enjoyed it. I always loved rock uh, music, and and I um, would always sing. You know, at the top of my lungs when I was cutting the lawn, so that nobody would hear me because the lawnmower always drowned me out. But I, again, I never thought of doing it as a career until my senior year of college when I was doing uh, Godspell, of all things. And it was then that people said to me, you know, you're really good. Did you ever think of doing this as a career? And that's when the light bulb went off. And I said, if I don't give this a shot, I'm going to say what if all my life. And I didn't want to live with that. So I already bought the sheepskin. You know, I had a degree. And uh, I figured I might as well use it in the meantime. So I got a job on Wall Street for a company called E.F. Hutton, mm -hmm. which, you know, people my age and older would know, but uh, younger people these days have no idea who that is, what, what company that is, but it was a big deal back in the 80s. And um, I got a lovely entry level job there and uh, I enjoyed it, but I always was pursuing theater on the side. So I would, I'd go up, um, this was down on Wall Street. So I'd go uptown on my lunch hours and slide my picture and resume under doors and do auditions, things like that. Um, and it wasn't until I got an audition for a company called L the Light Opera of Manhattan, right? Uh, shortened to Loom. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was working in the costume department and he got me an audition there and I got a job. Now, the Light Opera of Manhattan was a 52 week out of the year repertory company. They did uh, Gilbert and Sullivan and operettas and uh, all, all that sort of stuff. And you did a new show every two weeks. So I uh, got a job in the chorus making $35 a week. Wow. And I stayed working at, at E.F. Hutton during the day. So I would work at Hutton during the day. I'd go up at night and I'd rehearse uh, a show and then do another show that night. And then go back out to Long Island uh, after that and then come back in the next morning and do the whole routine all and, over again. And presumably you were making more money at E.F. Hutton than $35 a week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> call me crazy. I don't, I don't know. So, but I was did, I did both for quite a while until I couldn't do both anymore. And uh, I how how exhausted were you at that point? I was a lot younger. Um, I, I somehow I did it. I don't remember being tired, but uh, I was you know I was younger. I must have been tired, but it, it was it it was fun. I was enjoying I was enjoying things then. I was enjoying my life. Then, but after about a year and a half of doing both, I said I couldn't do both anymore. So I quit EF Hutton. My parents cried, <laughs> and I um, I started down the path of darkness, uh, but no, of, uh, of theater. So I um, well, uh, well, you went from I never you, looked back after that. You went from a life of of a, de a certain degree of surety to one of complete you don't know where you're going next. <clears throat> exactly. And that makes it incredibly challenging. And I understand why your parents cried, but yeah, uh, but well, you know, they just didn't, they just didn't have any reference. Uh, my parents were not theater people. Uh, they were, you know, middle-class uh, folks. My dad was an engineer. My mom uh, was a housewife. She raised me and my sisters. Um, she was also an artist in her younger years. So 
But they didn't know anything about theater other than what they read in the tabloids, and that's never a good thing. So, so they always just were afraid for me, and I understand totally where they were coming. So, so, all right, so many people think of, as you say, they come out of the womb knowing they're going to be a, a performer of some kind or a writer of some kind, something like that. Um, many people find it to be a calling. Over time, have you realized that it is your calling? Is that what happened? It, it did. I gravitated towards this, and I jumped in with both feet, and I had no training whatsoever when I first started. No schooling of any kind? No. No, I had no training whatsoever. Everything that I've learned has been trial and error. Wow. And, and it still is. I have trained, you know, both as an actor and a singer since I had become an actor, become, uh, joined this profession. But it was never, I never had any formal schooling. That's extraordinary. I mean, most everybody you probably have worked with had some kind of training prior to going into it. Oh, yeah. Most, most people. Like I said, most, many, most people, I would say, in this business know that they want to do this one at a very young age and they pursue it through their school years. Sure. So I'm, I'm curious, having had no training, have you found it to be a deficit in any way or have you found it to be a positive in some way? You know, it's a little bit of both. I think it's been a positive in that I've, I had a life prior to this. So I have interests outside of of theater. I'm not tunnel visioned. I wasn't tunnel visioned all my life about theater, 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 theater. You know? Right. Um, so I think that that was an advantage. Uh, the disadvantage is that when you're in school, you go through all sorts of um, classes on training of the classics and and theater history and training on training with your your voice and also certain acting techniques. You also develop a network of contacts and people in the business that I did not have when I started and I had to I had to develop them slowly but surely on my own as opposed to being in class with mm -hmm. all these people so it was a lot of um, that so that was a, a negative one, one of the things that I tell uh, my students and others who ask uh, and I, you're alluding to it is that school does more than just give you um, academic training. It actually uh, enables you to meet people and learn the business from and have trial and error where you can fail and you can fail without any threat to a career. Um, so being in school has advantages, though clearly you're the best example I know of, of, of the you don't need it in order to have some success. Uh, you don't, I, I don't think you, I don't think one necessarily needs it, but it's um, certainly a good thing to do. It's helpful, it's for sure. Yeah, it's helpful. Let's talk about your path a little bit. Obviously, you do dramas and Shakespeare and various plays, but you specialize generally in musicals. You're known for doing musicals. What is it about musicals, aside from the fact that you sing like a you know an angel, what attracts you to the form called musicals? Is it the singing or is it something else? Well, I kind of, I, I, honestly, I fell into it because I had a, a natural voice you know, I was um, I was blessed with a God given voice and that I certainly trained to get better. But I always I always wanted to act. Mm -hmm. um, I always was attracted to the straight drama side of things, but the voice got me the work and I that's what started me with musicals and one of the beautiful things about the two meshing is that in my when I came up in this career so many of the musicals that I was uh, coming coming uh, across were dramatic in form whether sure. it be you know even the old classics but the but things like uh, Phantom of the Opera and and Les Miserables they they allowed me to combine what I could do and what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know, as far as like my singing and also my my desire to be known as an actor. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. You know, do you think of yourself more as an actor who sings or a singer who acts or, does, or is it just a true mesh? I think it's a true mesh now. It's I, I think these well, these days I do 
probably 50% of both. Mm -hmm. I do both uh, musicals and uh, straight plays, whether they be classics or contemporary. Right. So I, uh, I, it's a pure mix right now. Do you I, I don't know whether I would classify myself as a singer who acts or an actor who sings. Right, because we, we know that they exist, that they're both sides of it. People get cast sure. because they sing like crazy but can't act all that well. And we know that the reverse is true, that they act great, but they're not such great singers. We, we yeah. know both. I mean, Rex Harrison had a hell of a career, and he was not what you would call a singer. But no. right. <laughs> so <laughs> how, how long do you think it was after you started into the business, after you left EF Hutton and you were really going at it? How long do you think it was before you felt like you really were good at it and that you were on the right path, that you had made the right choice? I think that that started happening both for me and also for my parents. Uh, when I was doing, uh, when I got cast in Camelot, mm -hmm. uh, opposite Richard Harris, a very because big that deal. was a it was a huge deal, and it's a uh, he was a he was a name that I knew and I admired, and I had watched uh, his career before I got to meet him and work with him, and it was certainly a name that my parents recognized because he was a star of their generation. Sure. So uh, when that happened it it made me feel okay this is this is definitely uh something i can do and this is something that i i'm good at it put me in a certain it put me in a in a category sure that uh, both i recognize and also my parents it, it wasn't fly by night or rinky dink and you were actually making money doing it and it was on a on a big a big platform yeah yeah uh, um all right so when you're looking at parts what for you makes a role attractive? What, what makes a role good for you? What kind of parts do you look for? I look for true three-dimensional characters mm -hmm. or one that I can, I can make so. Those tend to be the darker ones. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, I, I find them more interesting, to be honest with you. And I also, I love exploring the darker side of characters that have uh, certain flaws to them. I, I mean, I like that. And like I said, those tend to be the darker ones, but, but there are the non-dark ones too that, are, that have flaws. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to explore those. Many great stars that I've listened to and read about, they frequently prefer to play the villain or the heavy or the darker parts because they are more interesting to chew on. Um, yeah. Heroes tend to be a little bit more straightforward and a little tougher to, to get sort of fascinating about. They they are, but there's also you know the the antihero that it's the 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 flawed <laughs> the flawed hero mm -hmm, you know and, sure. and those I those I enjoy too you know the the leading man that is not that's not so perfect. So, all right, so talking about dark roles, we'll talk about Jekyll and Hyde for a moment. I don't want to dwell on Jekyll and Hyde. That's not what the purpose of the show is. But my assumption is that when you got cast as Jekyll and Jekyll and Hyde, that that was a very big break for you at that moment. Yes? Absolutely, yeah. And so it was important to your overall <clears throat> career at that moment. It was, yeah. I mean, that's that show changed my life uh, and the whole trajectory of my career. I, I, met, I imagine it did because prior to that, you were not as big an, a name in the in the theater world as you became from it, yeah. It was starting, you know. It was it was beginning because I I was doing uh, great work and or great works rather, uh, you know, uh, musicals that were um, exciting and got a lot of attention, and I therefore got attention from them. Whether they be, you know, I had a. a the first revival of the musical the rothschilds mm -hmm. uh, and that was off broadway and i did uh and the world goes round which was the you know the candor and a musical review that catapulted uh you know people like scott ellis the director and also uh susan stroman our choreographer and all of us that were involved with it i mean it was a that was a huge deal and then i got les mis uh, which was my Broadway debut. And then Jekyll and Hyde came right after that. So it, there was a progression happening. And Jekyll and Hyde, though, 
totally, <laughs> I skipped a bunch of steps. Which you, yeah. <laughs> it, it catapulted <laughs> you is what it is. Yes, so to speak. Do you think that um, you would have been just as happy if you'd had a, a journeyman's career that never went to those heights? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's about, for me, it's about the work, mm -hmm. you know, and it's about the journey, the personal journey. And I've learned in my career that it's really about that kind of growth uh, that that excites me. And it's uh, I, I'm I'm more in competition with myself than uh, with anybody else. Uh, it's about always improving myself. Mm -hmm. And so you look for shows yes, that, think, that will help you improve yourself then, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, if it doesn't scare me, it's not it's not really something to pursue that, that you know you hear this frequently from people who are in the business that that if the if the part doesn't scare them it's they know something's not quite right yeah i mean if it if it if it scares you then there's there's something about it that is and, and I'm, i apologize for the noise but there's uh construction there's construction going on I, there's nowhere else to hide um <laughs> I, yes. I've told I mean, I've told I've told many people over a long period of time that that it really is about the journey, that it's not if you ever think you've arrived, you're in trouble. Yeah, I think so, because it's 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 about always. I mean, it's called a craft for a mm -hmm. reason. Yeah, um, it's it's like uh, doctors are called a practice and lawyers are called a practice. It's something that you always work at. You always work towards, you always work to improve. I assume that over time, various people have come up to you and ask you, what, how do you have a career? How do you get your break? How do you move to the next level? Those kinds of things. I'm sure you get asked those questions by people who are trying to either break in or actually they're in and they're trying to go somewhere with it. Do you, do you have something that you tell them about having a career in the theater? Do you tell them that it's just a journey and to keep at it? What do you tell them? Yeah, pretty much because everyone's journey is completely different. And how I got to where I am is, is totally different than somebody else. And so for me to say, this is how you do it is ridiculous mm -hmm. because there's, there's no one way to do it other than always strive to be a better actor. And, and how do you do that? You constantly, train even after you supposedly make it and it's about um our goal as an actor is to understand human nature and to to imitate it to create characters and so you need to understand yourself you need to understand other people human nature you need to understand the workings of of things around you, you need to understand the workings of the world. So it's a it's no one just knows that you need to constantly work at it. And, um, and I think that that's, that's part of getting better. All right. So you you have, I think, uniquely um, managed to find yourself playing two huge parts that are both dual characters that are split characters. So uh, the Green Goblin and Jekyll and Hyde are both dual characters. Mm -hmm. What do you think that it was within you that was enabled you to find those two sides? The, the, as, as, as Stevenson said, the polar opposites, the polar twins. What, yeah. what do you think that, where did you find that? I'd be lying if I, if I said that, oh, there's not two sides to me. There are, there are two sides to everybody. Sure there, sure there are. And I was not, a tap, I was not afraid to tap into that darker side. Um, I was not afraid to go there. Honest to goodness, the, the harder of the two roles for me was the supposed good guy. Uh, sure. You know, it was it, because it was closer to who I am in my everyday world that uh, I was basically trying to play myself. And you'll ask any actor, that's the hardest thing for an actor to do is to play yourself or someone who is that close to you. It's a supposedly, and I don't know for my own personal self, but maybe you can answer this. One of the more difficult things to do on camera is just walk. Yeah. Because yeah. How, do you, how do you walk as that character? Yeah. 
exactly. And it sounds simple and it sounds ridiculous, but that's one of the more challenges. There's a, there's a, there's a whole Monty Python sketch to that, to that <laughs> regard, right? The, the, ministry, the ministry of the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, so, so I, I, and I'll, I'm going to get off of Jekyll in one second, but that was a, a mountain of a part to climb, was it not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was what one were, of the greatest experiences of my life. So, all right, I, what I want to ask you is, what were the biggest challenges? Was it the, the vocal challenge to get through? Was it the physical challenge? Was it both? What, was, what were the big challenges? And what did you then do to overcome those challenges? It was, um, it was a combination of all of them. It was an incredible vocal challenge to try to sing in two different sounding like two different voices mm -hmm. and physically it was challenging it was a it was a marathon and also to to do the to physically to be these two different beings um it was an emotional challenge and it was an acting challenge so how did i overcome them i trained vocally uh every week i would always go to have a voice lesson to make sure that I was tuned, uh, that I didn't, I wasn't getting off track and I was, I was keeping my voice totally in line uh, in doing what I was doing. Uh, I'd go to the chiropractor three times a week. And he said, basically, it looks like you had a, you were in a car accident every time you come in here. Wow. So look, I was throwing myself on the ground. I was throwing myself over lab tables. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. Yeah, very, um, very physical. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went to therapy once a week, you know, just to make just to keep my head straight, because it was a it was a lot of pressure to lead a new show and to have that that much responsibility. And, you know, you're dealing with awards uh, at the same time and, you know, opening night and awards seasons and things like that. It was you need to keep your head straight and recording a cast album and all the rest of it and recording that's exactly right we recorded a cast album at the same time and and uh you know just just you're doing the confrontation alone which was you know one, one person playing two parts at the same time just that had to have been physically challenging just by itself it was i mean there were a couple of times after i sang the first note and there was a blackout that i felt like i was going to pass out wow and i kind of I got my way off stage because it was just physically and also you spend all that air like the there's no more air inside your body wow so it was a it, yeah it got sometimes it was that intense well it, you know the world is glad that you did it <laughs> i'm certainly glad that you did it that's for sure i am i am too thank you all right so let's talk about auditioning what is your philosophy toward auditioning how do you prepare to audition what can you tell folks about your philosophy there's not enough there's not an audition that i don't go to that i'm nervous that i'm not nervous rather that's a natural that's a natural thing uh because auditioning is it's not quite acting it's another it's another it is acting but it's another animal in itself uh it's a talent all of itself and there are some people that are marvelous actors that are horrible auditioners mm -hmm. and there are amazing auditioners that that you know, are not the best actors. So how do you mesh the two? What do you what do you do to get through this process? And this was a philosophy that came to me from another friend in that you need to think of it as, hey, this is this is the only time I may get to play this character. Interesting. So I'm gonna do it the best I can and just enjoy doing it. It's so it puts your mind in a performance headset as opposed mm -hmm. to an audition headset, which I think is very useful. Uh, and I've I've found that I've enjoyed auditioning more thinking in those terms. You, you think of it as actually performing, not just auditioning. Yeah, it may be the only time I get a chance to, to play this character. So let's let's see what I can do with it. Let's see I, what fun I can have with it. I think that's a very a wise outlook on it because otherwise it feels like it's a some kind of a burdensome task versus you're doing something that is toward a, a conclusion an actual act yeah. that you're doing um, right. which is of course ultimately what all acting is isn't it you're you have a there's an objective that you must achieve in a scene and you go for that right right so all right so 
let's talk about your approach to performance. When you um, begin to work on a role, you get you get cast in something. And aside from reading the script, which is obviously the first step, what is your approach? How do you develop a character? What do you what are your first steps? I guess the first steps are to see how I can put myself into this character. That's what makes doing the same part by different people so interesting and unique and different is that if I go, if I go do a Phantom of the Opera, say now, I'm going to be a completely different Phantom than who's playing it now, just because of my own sensibilities are different than you know, no matter, even if I tried to copy somebody else, there's no way I can, I could, um, because well, I don't have those sensibilities. So nor, I, nor, nor I try just to put my own, my own self into that role. Nor should you copy somebody else's performance. I mean, obviously you have to perform it the way that you perform it. Right, right. It, it, all right, so do you do you take a script? Do you do any kind of a breakdown? I mean, actors famously do breakdowns, beat breakdowns, and all kinds of different breakdowns. Is that something that you do? Do you start looking for specific things in a script? You know, this is, and this is, we go back now to training. Right. Uh, because I have had to develop my own way of doing things. And, and I, because I didn't come from a, a strict training, so to speak, though I had training afterwards, I don't have a set way of doing anything. I work very instinctually. Okay. Um, so, but I do, I do go through script. I go through uh, whether it's an audition scene or something like that. And I will find the beat changes where it, what's first of all, what's going on in the scene? What's the scene about? What do I want out of this? And also where does it keep changing? Where am I surprised? So I, I look for all those, those types of things. You're saying all the things that most actors go through training to learn, which is there's an objective in the scene. What do you want? Right. How, do, how do you get there? What's in your way and how do you overcome it? Exactly. Right. I mean, and that, that, by the way, is the essence. It's of that simple and it's that difficult. <laughs> yeah, sure. Exactly. And, and that's the essence of good drama. All dr good drama is what does a character want? What are the objectives? in the scene, what are the obstacles in the way and how do you overcome them? That's, that, that's, that's the essence of all great drama. Yeah, so, you, yeah. so you're looking, you're actively, what you've said, what I was hoping you would say is that you're actively looking for those things that you can then use as your motivations within a scene. Yes, exactly. Do you have any particular special performance preparations that you go through? You, you, you've now rehearsed, you've been through that process. You're about to do performance. Do you do anything prior to a show? Do you have exercise ritual, vocal warm up? What do you do? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I warm up my voice every. Well, I I sing every day, one way or another. I do vocal exercises or I sing or something. But when I'm doing an actual performance, I do uh, warm up my voice at home um, because the the vocal exercises are too annoying to do in public. <laughs> I just, I do them at home. I do uh, physical stretches when I'm, uh, before I get, usually I'm, I'm usually one of the first people at the theater. I like to get there early. I, I like the ritual of it. I like to be in a, a quiet space um, before the activity begins. And so I like to stretch and get my body warmed up. I, other than that, it just kind of, uh, you know, I, I get dressed in a way that I feel the character is getting dressed. I mean, I, I, I just slowly try to get into the headspace of where I need to be. I, I, I don't normally like to joke around and party or something like that before a, before a performance. Uh, if I'm in a, a crowded dressing room or so, I'm usually kind of quiet um, just to kind of stay in the focus of it. So the, so the, the, like Olivier said that once he had the shoes and the coat and whatever the hair is, he kind of knew how he was getting into that role, that he needed yeah. that from the external in. That's yeah. what you're, you're saying something similar, that once you start to get into costume, put your makeup on and so on, that's bringing you into the role. Yeah, exactly. And and so it's not a, you're not going through sense memory or any of those kinds of things. No, I don't know anything about I mean, I don't, I wasn't trained that way, so right. I don't. You know, once I'm all prepared and I'm all set, 
uh, I sit, you know, quietly for a while and I think of how, how this play is going to begin and where I am emotionally before the play begins. And then it's about getting on the train. All right. So once you're on the train and now you're in a run, like you're doing a, you're in well into a run of a show. Are you still looking for new things as you're performing? I sometimes, I sometimes do uh, consciously, but more often than not, I just allow, uh, I, I try to just be moment to moment and allow for something different to happen to me. You know, I stay open to my, to my fellow performers and, um, allow them to affect me in a different way. You, you must be a very, very good listener. I am a very good listener. I, mean, I, have, to, I, I have to say that I do listen very well, well to that's, other actors. You, you couldn't do what you just described a moment ago without being a very good listener. Um, you, you can't pick up on what the differences are from night to night on another actor's performance. You're living for what they're saying. Yeah, and that's one of the... That's one of the disadvantages of living from an objective standpoint uh, because you're always trying to do something to the other person which is useful and it's and it's uh it's a very useful tool but you also need to be in the moment and be spontaneous uh and allow things to be fresh and uh listen and respond mm -hmm. it's very meisner i come from more of a meisner background than anything else you're living in the part for what's happening now not for what you what you've learned you know what you're uh, blocked to do but you're living for that moment yeah I, I think that that's important to understand um uh you must be a very good memorizer of lines you've learned a lot of lines in a lot of different kinds of ways do you have a a tip or a, tr a trick for memorization i <laughs> You know, it's a muscle. It's a. It's like going to the gym every day. Uh, you develop a muscle in, of to memorize. But it's it's not an easy task. I'm not. I wish I had a photographic memory. I wish I could just look at a page and it would be in my head. But I have to beat it into me. I have to go through the lines over and over and over and over again. And there are a number of techniques that have come to my attention, and I've toyed with them and I can't say that they're better or not. Some people will write down, well, it's sometimes you find, I find it useful to physically write out my lines so that the, the physicality of the handwriting, the words, I'm forming the words ends up staying in my brain a little more. I've used that. Some people have tried the technique of writing down the first letter of every word in their line mm. so that the letter is in your head and it, it associates to the word, I guess. I haven't found that useful for me. Uh, and I remember uh, also uh, Bill Nye, he has a very interesting technique that I've tried and that is um, say every line, I think he says 16 times and then connect it to the, and then connect it to the previous line and then go that through line by line it's a long tedious process i just i just beat it into my head it, uh, it's it's brute, repetition repetition it's, it's brute force yeah pretty much and so one of the things that i i've taught my uh, students for a long time and, and it's a mystery as to why it works and you've already said it which mm -hmm. is i say when you're taking notes to a student when you're taking notes if you take notes by typing them into a computer or onto your phone you won't remember what the notes were, but if you write them down, the physical act of somehow yeah. between the hand and the brain, it, yeah. it puts it into record mode in your head for some reason. Yeah, that's why um, many actors will probably say this, because uh, this is something I, I believe, that the, the best way to memorize your lines is to to associate them with blocking so that there's a physicality connected to the word. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, Shakespeare says it, the action to the word, the word to the action. I find that, you know, if people ask me to come into a, come into rehearsal, first day of rehearsal, completely off book, it's impossible. You know, I'll do, I will do preliminary work on it. I'll have it, the idea is pretty much in my head, but the lines don't really get into me 
until until I connect them to my body. And that, that, that makes a lot of sense that you're actually the, the lines are connected to some form of activity. Yeah, Phys physical activity. It's not just right. words. Right. I think that makes a, a whole lot of sense. You've worked for many different directors over the years. What would you say are one or more important lessons you've taken away from the better directors you work with? Uh, good question. Well, because I because I never went to school for this, I always feel like I'm in learning mode, and I always feel like I am. I have something that I need to work on always, and I, and I some of the best directors treated me as a colleague more and relied on me to to collaborate with them which which forced me to show up even more you know if you get a director that that says okay uh this is how we're going to do it this is what i want you to do and this is what i i you know I, 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 this is what you're feeling in this moment and this was it i'll shut down because it just doesn't allow me to to create and to work to to show up at a higher level. Uh, and those directors that expect more of me are the ones that I learn the most from. You, you learn more from what they were expecting you to do rather than from them telling you something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of, that's part of trusting oneself. You know, that this is, this is a little bit off the topic to some extent, but uh, the first time I was asked to direct, I was terrified, which is why I said yes, which goes back to, you know, if sure. something scares you, it's it's something you need to do. Sure. The one thing that a friend of mine told me in my deciding on this, on doing it, was that he said, you know more than you think you know. I'm like, yeah, you know, you're right. And I think that that's, that says, that's something about, you know, where I am in my whole career. You know, all along. Well, sure. I know, I know more than I think I know. So I have to trust myself a little what bit more. What do you think you've learned as a director that's helped you as an actor? The one thing that I've had to do as a director, because I am a, such an instinctual actor, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't put what I need to do into words so much. They're mostly feelings, emotional connections. Um, but when I'm directing, I have to tell another actor where, what I'm thinking how to direct them and to talk to them like an actor mm -hmm. so that they will understand what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate. That has made me a better actor because I've had to put into words my, what I, what I'm working on, what I'm, what I'm doing is what I'm do what I'm doing in a scene, you know? So that's, that's made me a better actor. You have to sort of codify what you're doing as an actor instinctually you now have to actually form a, a way to do that. Yeah, I have to put it into words. And so now, because they can't, they can't read my brain. You know, sure. they've got to. I've got. I've got to tell them what I'm thinking and and how to communicate in a ways that they that they will understand. If only actors were telepathic, it would be easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you think you do now differently? in working with directors that you didn't do early on that's that you've learned over time that this is a better way to work if they're giving you let's say a director's giving you a note that you don't understand or how to work with it how do you handle that now is it different than when you first started out yes uh, i think that my ego probably got in the way more when i was younger and i may have you know reacted uh the wrong way as a as a criticism as opposed to as being criticized as opposed to a positive kind of uh, note to get you had more of an emotional so, reaction than it than an intellectual reaction yeah yeah uh and i think what i've learned over the years is that if i'm getting a direction that i don't i, I may not fully agree with i will do it anyway Mm -hmm. And I will, I will usually do it three times. Uh, and after, after the third time, and if it still does not ring true to me, it will be at that point that I will go to the director and say, you know, I, I, this is not working. And I'd like to go back to what I was originally thinking of doing. And I think directors will generally, they respect that mm -hmm. more because you gave it a shot. 
You know, you gave you gave it your best shot. You tried it a number of times, and then after after that, it was like, you know, let me. Can I just try it the way I was thinking? And that, they usually say, yeah, go ahead, do it. And and my assumption is, is early on in your career, you didn't do it that way. No, no, you, I probably would have argued or something like that, or have done it begrudgingly and been upset about it, but but and never have gone back and said, hey, can I can I try and do it my way now? So I, I, I've learned, I've grown. And well, you should. <laughs> yeah. Would, would, wouldn't be much fun if you weren't, I would think. Um, so I just want to briefly talk about the difference between stage work, which you've done the most of, and working on a set with a camera. Um, w- w- the obvious big differences are the stage is big and outward, and the camera work is a little smaller and more intimate. Um, but are there other differences for you in the way that you approach the, the difference between stage work and camera work? Well, camera work is very difficult in that you will shoot out of sequence. You know, it's uh, when you do a play uh, or a musical, you start at the beginning and you go through to the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you're doing TV work or a film, you can start, you know, in, in the middle. Uh, or they may shoot the last scene first for whatever reason they want to do that. And you have to be so in it. And I think that's why a lot of, um, you hear about, you know, a lot of these movie stars that they, they get, you know, crazed that way because they are, they're so in the character because they have to be, because they've got to shoot so out of sequence that they've got to be so in it to work that way. So I, I hear all these stories and I'm like, well, I totally understand that. I mean, it's, it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's a, big, there's a big difference that way. And also, you don't get a whole lot of rehearsal when you're doing TV or film. If any. If any. I mean, especially if you're doing a, a guest spot on something, uh, you have to come in, lines memorized, you'll have a, an initial blocking rehearsal. And then that's it. It's, you, you know, the, you go. The, the camera goes on and then you've got to, you've got to perform. Yeah. So it's, that is, it's not easy. You, my, my assumption from your saying that is, is you prefer stage work to camera work. Yes. I, in a, in a way, yeah, I do. I'm also, but I'm also more used to it. Mm-hmm. So I can't, I can't say too much. I mean, the, the one beautiful thing about um, the one, there are a number of things, but one of the beautiful things about uh film and TV work is that you can get so intimate, you can get so internal, you can, it's, it's all about what your thoughts are. Well, the, the, the audience in a theater has a hard time seeing into you, but the camera sees right through you. Yes. The camera does a lot of the work for you. I mean, you'll look at, you, you may work with a, a, another actor on a TV show or something and you and as a theater performer I'll we'll look at them and I'm like you're not doing anything mm-hmm. you're not doing a thing but I see the end result and I'm like oh my god it's well, just like whatever whatever you what I thought you were not doing has translated into a brilliant performance so it's it's really fascinating so f- fa- famously Gary Cooper one of the great Hollywood stars of all time uh, he was so underplayed that people would be on a set and they'd say he isn't doing a thing. And no. then they'd get back in the screening room and it was all right there. Yeah. Uh, but you also notice that in most of his films, the camera is like right. It's it's all about his eyes. His eyes. It's like right in his face. If you if you see High Noon, it's it's all the f- camera is right in his eyes the entire time. It's amazing. And that is an ex- extraordinarily wonderful movie. I mean, that's. Yeah, it is. It's an exceptional movie. So mm-hmm. I've been speaking to Bob Cuccioli for coming up on an hour almost, and um, we're going to sort of wind this thing down a little bit. And I'm just curious, in all of your many experiences, can you um, share with us a story that is either weird, quirky, oddball, strange, or just plain funny that's happened to you? Oh, God. You know, there have been so many things <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's hard to pinpoint like one uh, big one uh, there. I mean, I've got, you know, whether they're ghost stories or 
uh, fighting, uh, fighting, you know, June bugs uh, <laughs> on stage at, uh, at, at Wolf Trap. Well, but tell, one us, of the, tell us a one ghost of the story. Worst, I want to hear a ghost the, story. <laughs> <laughs> I love ghost stories. Well, I got two, actually. Great. One, one is, uh, I was doing a play called um, A Moon to Dance By with Jane Alexander mm -hmm. and Gareth Sachs. And we were at Pittsburgh Playhouse, mm. which is, I don't know if you know this or not, it is the listed as the most haunted theater in North America. It, the Pittsburgh Playhouse is now in a new facility in downtown Pittsburgh. It's no longer in existence. Yeah, no, the old one. Yes, I know. I know the old one is haunted. Yes. Yeah, it was. It's listed as one of the haunted, as the most haunted theater in, I think, North America. Wow. Okay. So we were there to to do a moon to dance by, and we were rehearsing in the basement. And there's nobody else around. And we took a we took a five minute break or a ten minute break or something like that. And when we came back, Jane said, "I just had my butt pinched at the water cooler." And we're like, "What?" She said, "Yeah, I just I just had my ass pinched while I was at the water fountain. I turned around and there was nobody there." So I'm like, "Okay, that's." That was funny. That was that nothing happened to me, but that was that was funny. But what did happen to me once when I was working at, up at Goodspeed mm -hmm. in Connecticut? Right now they have these these this lovely complex of of actor housing. It's all brand new stuff there. But back in the old days, the how the actors were put up in these mansions, these oh Cape Cod houses. I mean, they're huge, uh, beautiful, old houses and uh i was in one of them called the lawton house and uh this was a time when you had cassette tapes i mean this was back in the 80s and things right. like that and i had a bunch of cassette tapes and uh they were in cases and i had them you know stacked on my room and i i left to go to rehearsal i locked my door and i went uh, out and went to rehearsal when i came back after rehearsal I unlocked my door, I walked in, and the cassette tapes were strewn all over the room. Oh. Under the bed, all over the all over the room. That's the weird. next that's weird. The next morning I went into the bathroom and my razor was it's a you know, it's a one of those Gillette safety razor things with a cartridge that you yeah. you know click in or whatever. Right. And uh I had used it the day before the cartridge was was where it was was connected to the razor where it would normally be. Um, when I want to pick up and picked it up to shave and the cartridge was reversed so that when you shave the blades were going the opposite direction. Oh. So in essence, you wouldn't you wouldn't shave yourself because uh, the blades were going the wrong way. Right. There was no explanation for any of this stuff. Obviously, you know, some spirit did not like the music I was playing <laughs> and, and, and thought that I should grow a beard. So I don't know what happened, but that, well, was, a, it, that was a weird event. It just proves that everyone's a critic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Last question for you today. You've already given us an enormous amount of um, advice and help along the way here. Um, but I'm wondering if you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you give to others about how to help them get into the industry or if they're in a little bit, maybe get to that next level. First of all, the, the climate now is so hard to read. Where is this business going? Mm -hmm. You know, where, how do you prepare for anything? How do you, you have no idea what the future holds. We don't even know whether, I mean, theater is, is limping back. Broadway's, you know, reopening and everything, but how long is it going to last? How long is it going to last? When is the next shoe going to drop? Mm -hmm. uh, is so to give anybody kind of uh, advice right now is is tough. I mean, I rely on what we talked about earlier about um, you know what our job is as actors uh, and. 
how to keep improving and how to keep learning and keep knowing yourself more and keep trying to understand human nature and staying alert and staying awake, staying present, living in the now, you know, I don't want to get all woo woo and everything, but I mean, that's, that's a very real thing. That's real. Um, And that also goes with, you know, where we are today. I mean, an actor needs to be flexible. You know, you need to be able to go with the flow. Uh, You need to be able to ride a wave. You need to be able to figure, you know, adapt to whatever is thrown at you and what, whether that's on stage or whether that's in life. And I think that's, that's the best advice I can give right now. I think that that's very sound and solid advice right now. We're having this conversation sort of uh, almost two years into the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And uh, you're correct that to, to, things are sort of sputtering back to life, but we don't yeah. know what's going to happen next. And it, you know, the theater is among the first things that get tossed out. We're not, um, you know, we're not government government funded like other countries. I mean, we've, the theater is a commercial enterprise for the most well, part, and, except for, you know. And unfortunately, this particular disease is not good with people packed into a, a crowded space together. So uh, that really prohibits a theatrical thing from happening. Yeah, I mean, that's why... Um, film and tv are able to to at least do a little bit better because they are they are more insulated sure sure they don't have to deal with an audience that's exactly right and they are able to sort of function where the theater cannot or dance or or symphony or whatever it would be well bob cuccioli this has been an absolutely wonderful hour i can't thank you enough for coming on the show and and being it was my pleasure and so we've come to the end of today's story beat If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.